Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome again to Syrian Analysis. I'm your host, Kirk Kalmasian. Thank you very much for tuning in to today's live streaming. I appreciate you all, guys, whether you're watching us on YouTube or on Rumble. And I'm very happy to have my friend Vanessa Billy with me today from Damascus. Vanessa, thank you so much for coming to the show. For those who don't know, I'm sure most of the followers know you. You're an investigative yeah. journalist, an independent journalist, now based in Syria. And your opinions and your investigations uh, went viral during the Syrian war. And you're one of the first people who debunked many of the myths uh, surrounding around the uh, Syrian uh, crisis and the Syrian war. So thank you so much for coming to the show. Oh, you're welcome, Kevork. It's lovely to be on with you again. I always enjoy it. Uh, actually, I made a rule on this channel that I am a um, free speech absolutist, unlike uh, Elon Musk, uh, which means that I don't delete comments, people who disagree with me, even when people come and just attack me, calling me names or stuff, I don't delete comments and I don't ban people from the channel. But when people are coming to slander my guest, and in this case yourself, and they're calling you whatever, it is, especially when it comes to the vaccines in this case, uh, I, would, I wouldn't tolerate that, especially when it's not about objective criticism but rather calling names uh, for my guest and also threatening my channel with reporting that this person whoever she is she says she is a medical professional and she's going to report this video to youtube so i didn't only delete this comment i also banned this person from commenting on my uh, channel ever again and whatever we discuss in this uh, video those are our own opinions you are free to make up your mind and you can follow the guidelines you can go to whatever authorities you believe in and check the efficacy and the safety of any of the vaccines and make up your mind. What we're doing here is a critical discussion, a brainstorming, and you can take it or leave it. But our advice and my advice, especially for you, is to read, to research, to dig in and make up your mind. That's all what we're asking. And uh, we hope that YouTube would tolerate that. But before we start this conversation, uh, this past week, 10 days, it was very, very, in my opinion, uh, critical, especially in the UK, we have um, uh, Richard Methurst was stopped in the airport and he was detained for 24 hours. His electronics were confiscated and interrogated. And you know this procedure because you passed through similar experience in the past. And also we have the uh, case of the arrest of the UK journalist Sarah Wilkinson and the police came to her house before 7.30 in the morning, 12 police officers in total, or what they call counterterrorism uh, officers, and they uh, arrested her for content that she has posted online. Her house is being has been raided, and they have seized all her electronic devices as well. Today, I was reading on the page of uh, Jonathan Cook. He added some new details into this case. He says that this is an utterly... I would just screen this because it's important for the people to see what we are reading. So Jonathan's uh, statements are this. Just a second on my software. So... He says, this is an utterly shocking account from journalist Sarah Wilkinson of her recent violent arrest by 16 counterterrorism police, several masked at 7.30 a.m. They smashed up or stole many of her belongings, emptied an urn of her mother's remains over the floor, have denied her the right to touch any electronic device, even a phone, though she has a potentially life-threatening medical condition, stolen her passport, which she needs to produce or it will lead to a bail infraction and possibly a five-year jail term and much else besides. She has, of course, been stripped of the right to do journalism, all of this under Section 12 of the Draconian Terrorism Act. This is clearly intended as a campaign of terror meant to intimidate others from speaking up about Israel's genocide in Gaza. We are being reminded that you don't need to be a Julian Assange to be targeted and have your life turned upside down. We are being reminded that ultimately the UK is a police state and that our freedoms are a gift from those who rule over us. You went even further, Vanessa, in this case, and you said that um, you had an article on your um, uh and your substack, and uh, you said that UK is officially a Stasi state, or Stasi <laughs> state, I don't know how to pronounce that. I mean, first of all, I would like to hear your thoughts. How, how, how were you treated last time when you landed in the UK? Why did they uh, stop you? 
what questions do they usually ask? What is this terrorism act that they are now abusing it against the journalists? And where is the UK is headed after this Gaza onslaught? Yeah, well, I mean, actually, I was detained. I wasn't arrested. I was detained under Section 7 of the Terrorist Act. Journalist Kit Clarenberg was detained under Section 4 of the Terrorist Act, I think about a year after myself. Um, I was detained towards the end of COVID. So I think it was around November 2022, which was the first time I had gone back to the UK since 2019 only to see my family before Christmas. I was detained for six hours. Under Section 7, it's effectively a fishing expedition by the security forces uh, in the UK, so MI6, MI5, through uh, the terrorist, the, the anti-terrorist police. Now, in my case, although I was detained for six hours, everything was downloaded from my phone. I think I was actually one of the first journalists in the UK to be detained under this section. Um, and they kept me for the full six hours, which is the maximum they can detain you. But they were, um, you know, apart from the fact that you have to give fingerprints, you have to have your DNA taken, you have to have your photograph taken in kind of POW positions. <laughs> you know, you, you do feel uh, psychologically that you're a criminal, that you're being treated as a criminal. But they were basically very courteous. I think what has changed since October the 7th, and now, of course, also we're in the Keir Starmer, Tony Blair government, because yeah. Tony Blair is controlling uh, Keir Starmer and, and his policies. We're seeing an absolute incredible descent into totalitarianism, fascism, in my opinion. And as I said, you know, these, these police are behaving like Gestapo. They're not behaving like uh, policemen who, who are not even yet charging both these individuals. And also Paul Barnard, by the way, of Palestine Action, which is the group that's been leading the campaign, uh, direct action campaigns against Albert Systems, one of the weapons manufacturers that is supplying um, Israel with, with weapons to genocide Palestinians. Now, of course, we're seeing it also in West Bank as well as in Gaza. Um, and so I think now what we're seeing is, is an unbelievable and actually a pretty horrific increase in um, the methods to censor free speech as regards uh, those that are against genocide. Because actually in Sarah Wilkinson's case, she's not necessarily, as far as I'm aware, been speaking about the armed resistance or supporting the armed resistance in her statement. She's been simply um relaying the horrific event on an hourly basis that are ongoing in gaza which is you know the genocide the de facto genocide that's been carried out by israel um in an intensified manner since october the 7th so she's only been reporting on the facts from the ground inside gaza that's it she doesn't have an opinion on the so-called prescribed terrorist organizations, which are Hamas and Hezbollah. And here, I really want to raise the question, why are Hamas and Hezbollah prescribed in the UK? What threat are Hamas and Hezbollah to UK national security? None. And both these organizations, Hamas is the official government in Gaza. Hezbollah uh, is, of course, part of the coalition government in Lebanon. So who is the UK protecting when it is prescribing these two organizations? Of course, it's protecting the national security of Israel that is embedded in every sector of UK society. The UK state is effectively captured by the Zionist regime in every sector of British society. So that's a very important point for me to make because you know we are potentially, all of us, going to be targeted for support of these two organizations, which in this region are recognized as legitimate government organizations. Yeah, but you remember, Vanessa, during the Syrian war, uh, when uh, there were organized campaigns to recruit people from the UK to send them mm. as uh, suicide bombers to Syria, mm. there were no attempts to stop 
these terrorists from coming to Syria and blowing up themselves among the civilians in mm-hmm. in 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 my country where you reported uh, from, right? This was mm-hmm. something. Pl- this was something more encouraged, in my opinion, because silence during this time was encouragement for these people to go. And I remember I watched a, a, a reportage, an investigation on the German CDF uh, on this case, which is a uh, public television. This was in 2014 or 15, a reportage on the ZDF, and the journalist was uh, asking a question to the head of the police department or the uh, counterterrorism department in Munich, in Bavaria. And he asked him, do you guys know that hundreds of Germans are going to Syria? And his answer was very honest, brutally honest. And he said, we don't only know that these people are going to Syria to fight alongside ISIS. We encourage them to go. If they don't have a travel document, we give them the travel document to go to Syria because they wanted to export this um, internal problem that they have in Germany, or in in this case, in my opinion, also similar in the UK, to the outside world. If you're radicalized, we can weaponize you and send you to the war zones where um, there is a government that we dislike go and fight this government there or this army and that. So this the utter hypocrisy of truly sending suicide bombers, let's say, to Iraq mm-hmm. and Syria, fighting alongside ISIS, whereas uh, Hezbollah and Hamas, they have never uh, attacked, let's say, the UK or threatened the national security. You can probably think that they're radical organizations and they don't like their ideology and you despise what they stand for. But uh, objectively speaking, these groups... They don't pose any threat mm-hmm. against the UK, which comes to the question, then why? And you answer this question and you say because of the protecting the national security of Israel. This is something really baffling, uh, seeing the governments in, in Europe, in, in the UK are protecting mm-hmm. Israel more than protecting their own, let's say, uh, national security in this case. And mm-hmm. from here, it's, 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 it's really um, infuriating to see that people are, especially yourself and other journalists, are being uh, targeted like this and abused uh, by... Uh, such a law, which is like you're treated like you're a terrorist in this case, right? Mm, absolutely. And um, just a reminder also that I think it was in 2018, Sadiq Khan in the UK offered a six month amnesty to British terrorists that were fighting alongside Al Qaeda in the northwest of Syria to return safely to the UK. Mm. And when you're talking about hypocrisy, the revoking of the British citizenship for Shamima Begum, who as a 15-year-old was trafficked with the knowledge of MI6 by CIA outreach agents with her, her companions, all of them under the age of 16, to Syria as ISIS brides. And this isn't yes. an isolated case. Right. So, so, and and then you have journalists like Alex Crawford of Sky News, um, uh, BBC journalists. We sort of remember the the Captagon report uh-huh. where the journalist uh-huh. is actually embedded with Al Qaeda or Hayat Tahrir al Sham, as it's now rebranded in Idlib. Um, and yet, these journalists are never held to account, mm-hmm. whereas they are literally uh, embedded with those terrorists factions they receive prizes yeah that they have euphemistically (laughs) called rebels and and democracy bringing uh, revolutionaries and so on knowing full well that they are de facto terrorist organizations acting as proxies of the western government that are now accusing genuine journalists who are trying to to basically uh, disseminate truth in in contrast to the legacy media that is constantly obfuscating the truth and and basically distorting and perverting it so that we get a completely misguided opinion of every single global situation that is ongoing at the moment and there are many yeah. um so it you know and and I just want to come back to what happened to Sarah because you mentioned the passport this for me was I mean, what they did was so sinister, and she's right in that she describes it as like a Mossad or a Shin Bet uh, operation, the way that they spoke to her, the racism that they demonstrated towards Palestinians in their discussions with her, 
um, the turning upside down of the urn containing her mother's ashes, and then the guy was apparently kneeling in the ashes, which is complete desecration, right? They bugged the house. She discovered this afterwards when she discovered like bits of the plaster of the wall on the floor. They wow. they had bugged the house. They took the bugs out. They hid her medical card, for example, in the mattress. Um, they told her, like you said, they took her passport, but they denied taking her passport. They didn't give her um, evidence that they had taken the passport. And now they've told her in seven days she has to produce her passport. So they, as she describes, they've entrapped her. And not only this, she has to take, I think, something like three buses to get to the office where she has to show her passport. Mm -hmm. And she can't return on the same day. They told her, we'll bring a tent. You can sleep outside in November in the UK. I mean, wow. you know, this is complete. Uh, that's why I said this is just Stasi treatment of UK citizens that are not even yet charged. Right? I mean, Metas is also under a three month bail, whereas yeah. I, I haven't seen what's actually happening as conditions of his bail, but I presume he can't leave the UK and go back to where he lives. Right. So I'm, I'm assuming he's in a kind of three month limbo waiting to see if they will even charge him. And yeah. the same for Sarah, but with Sarah, they're literally, it appears, entrapping her in order for her to be forced to violate the bail conditions, in which case she faces five years imprisonment. So this is, it's not a chilling effect. This is a freezing effect on free speech. What do you advise to the journalists, Vanessa? I've been, I've been speaking on this channel in the past few weeks after these uh, developing events, telling to people that um, speaking your mind and the truth and what you believe is the truth is nowadays is very dangerous business and you could be arrested detained charged and you could end up in jail i mean they have made an example out of uh, julian assange and yeah. they are now this train of let's say um suppression and coming after mm -hmm. the journalists it has accelerated and I see people telling, oh, just leave, go to somewhere else, like uh, relocate and this and that. And I totally understand that this could be one of the solutions for it, right? But do you <laughs> see that if the, if the people speak up collectively, can that make any change or the situation is hopeless now in the European continent? I think there is an advantage in numbers, yes. Um, and I think now that obviously we're aware that that they are ramping up the censorship, then we have to prepare ourselves. In other words, you have to have a good lawyer uh, on the end of a phone so you can call him immediately. That's something that I've definitely done uh, in preparation. If I go back to the UK, I don't have any plans at the moment. Um, and in numbers, you know, the, the problem is that as independent media, as you know, we are relatively isolated because we're scattered all over the world in different areas of the world. And it's very it's much harder for us to come together than the massive media complex um, in the West that, that is leading these destructive campaigns. You know, we don't have the resources. We don't have um, that vast. A cluster of organizations that has our back. We don't have insurance. We don't have um, that kind of legal protection that they have. Um, but we need to start organizing something. I mean, it's interesting that Mary Costa Kidis in Australia, who's a mainstream media presenter, um, is being now attacked by the Dionysus Federation of Australia for two tweets. Like, and they're actually retweets. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. But her case is now being taken up uh, for free, pro bono, uh, by a legal organization in Australia. So I think as journalists, we need to start putting feelers out for uh, legal organizations and legal representatives that are prepared to do this work for free on the basis that if not, everyone is under attack. Because, you know, the, it, it's a bit try to say we are all Sarah Wilkinson yeah. or we are all etc but it's true yeah. it can happen to any of us at any time and and the extraordinary thing is 
if, for example, it were Syria that was doing this, <laughs> can you imagine? Well, I know you can imagine the reaction from the West. It would be sanctions and regime change as it was, right? But what the UK is now doing is the equivalent to a country like Saudi Arabia, one of their allies, or to Israel. All we're missing so far is, is the physical torture, but we've reached a point of, of uh, psychological torture. This is a psychological war against independent <laughs> journalists. Yes. Uh, the, the, what's baffling is, Vanessa, is that in these countries, um, these politicians are do, do still have still have the audacity to say that we have a democracy here, we have a freedom of speech and freedom of press. I remember a few years ago when I was targeted by a media campaign and uh, I had to hire lawyers, multiple lawyers. Mm -hmm. It it costs a hell of a money, and I did mm -hmm. it silently because I didn't want to make my case public back then. And uh, they drain you like this is the yeah. this is the goal. They want to drain you because they know that the costs of the legal costs are very mm. expensive and you don't you're not a rich person and they know how to drain you in this case and also they all always have some uh, i don't it's not even weird it's just a manipulative um let's say argument and that is oh look we have a, a freedom of press in this country but you're not a journalist we don't consider you a journalist you're a propagandist therefore the laws for the free press do not apply to you. So all of a sudden you're deprived from your journalistic status just because someone yeah. said that you're not a journalist. So this is becoming really uh, the, the new norm, let's say, in, in, in these countries. I, I would like to also, since we're talking about democracy, today I was preparing like a short video for my ex account and I was following what happened in Germany during these uh, past few days when uh, where we had two regional elections in Thuringia mm. and in Saxony. And I found there, there, there is a new talking point now, Vanessa. Uh, before these elections, uh, we always uh, had this uh, talking point that this is a far right and this is a far left. And so they, they wanted to exclude them from or discourage the people from voting uh, to these parties, let's say. Those were in opposition of the current ruling uh, mm -hmm. coalition for sending weapons to Ukraine or supporting Israel, this and that. Now we have a different talking point, and that is um, there, we have democratic parties and undemocratic parties. Even if the parties, uh, even if a party wins the elections and the coalition considers them undemocratic, they consider themselves the winner of the election because they say that the democratic parties accumulated the most uh, votes in this case, and the undemocratic parties are already like we don't consider them part of the discussion. But these parties never address why a very big majority of the people voting for the far right and the far left in this case, due to the failures of the government, skyrocketing of the prices, rents are very mm -hmm. expensive. Nobody, nobody in, at my age can buy an apartment in Germany. That's like completely mission impossible. It's too expensive. Low pensions for the older people. You see them in the streets collecting the uh, the the cans to recycle them. Twenty five cents because it's not enough what they are receiving. Insecurity everywhere, mm -hmm. wherever you walk. There are knife attacks in Germany. You don't know one day somebody could attack you. Now we have uh, we are sending our taxpayer money to Russia and to Israel. So there. Are, many reasons for these people to vote for the other parties that the coalition or the establishment parties do not really understand. Therefore, now we have this new talking point. You're undemocratic, and this is really dangerous to our democracy. So I foresee in the future that this suppression and the persecution against the journalists, it will also move to big political parties trying to ban these political parties in order to keep this... Um, exclusive exclusivity of this political approach, let's say in Ukraine or in other places. So I truly see that the future is bleak in yeah. uh, Western Europe and in the UK, in Germany. I'm, I'm Maybe I'm wrong. I'm just being pessimistic, but I don't see that we are headed to brighter days. <laughs> no, and I think you had um, Alex Craner on quite recently yeah. and, and I was um, speaking with him quite recently also, and he's actually done a really good report on the coming collapse, particularly of the UK, but of course that is going to have the ripple effect in all of the EU because 
every country that is effectively under the control of the US or in an alliance with the US is committing suicide, economic suicide, by pouring billions into a failed war in Ukraine that has effectively you know, killed a huge percentage of the Ukrainian population. Um, but is also costing the UK in particular, I think they're the biggest funder in, in this case, uh, because Zelensky is going to default on, on the national debt. Of course he is. You know, he's already made it quite clear that he's going to default on that debt. But what happens? The EU just keeps giving more money. So does the UK. And then put on top of that the, the support that is being given to Israel, and now we start to see with Keir Starmer's government in the UK, the measures that are coming in, the austerity measures that are coming in pre-winter that are going to affect every single you know, person in that population. And as Alex worked out, the debt default in the UK, I think the Bank of England is unique in the sense that it can't be allowed to go under. So the government will bail out the Bank of England by taking that money from every individual in the UK. And mm -hmm. I think Alex worked out it's something like 2,400 per individual. But of course, then you have to extrapolate out children and, and people that are not working and so on. So this debt will actually fall on the shoulders of the working class and the middle class predominantly. And, and it wow. will destroy the UK effectively, you know, it's terrifying. And of course, the only way that these countries can can prevent the effects of this happening is to create more war. Because, you know, that that creates a threat that is greater than the economic threat against yes. people. We know this. Existential it's, it's, threat. Yeah, exactly. And so there it, is yes, the... it's a bad future. I don't see how there's any escape from this endless cycle um, in in the past three months or four months uh, maybe a little bit more i also found that there is a scripted rhetoric uh, from the uk from uh, germany from france mm -hmm. that war is imminent against yeah. russia so in five years we have to get ready for war with russia and therefore the military <laughs> spending has to increase and yeah. i was talking to um the alistair cook on uh, on this topic and he told me um, they couldn't, they couldn't, uh, these, wh whoever are they with the black suits and uh, the in, in, in dark rooms, they couldn't really convince or enforce the agenda on the people, on uh, the environmental agenda and the corona agenda on the people to increase this uh, budget, I increasing the budget. Um, therefore, they are moving now to the military. Uh, sector and that is like we have a imminent threat coming from Russia. They needed, they wanted for Russia to invade Ukraine, so they create this uh, scenario among the uh, population in Europe that uh, Russia is going to march to Europe and we have to increase the spending and we have to be ready in five years. We have to uh, uh, reintroduce the uh, what what do we say the uh, uh, the, the the recruitment in the in the military mm -hmm. conscription. Because that's coming in in the UK, definitely. I don't know about Germany. Yeah, so they are getting ready, let's say. Uh, if you want to open the door for anyone, for a guest. No, uh, it's electricity. About that. I can... Sorry, the electricity. Okay. <laughs> when it comes on, I have like a doorbell sound. <laughs> uh, okay, <laughs> you're more sophisticated there. <laughs> <laughs> when I first came here, it used to freak me out. I used to think, someone's at the door, like who's there? But no, it's just that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and since we're speaking about this, um, let's say the agendas behind uh, science, like uh, I, I, during the during the Corona times, and I have to make this disclaimer again for YouTube that we are not discouraging people to uh, go against the guidelines of the health authorities. We're just doing brain brainstorming here. Uh, there are always health crises, and people were infected uh, by Corona and uh, infected by other viruses around the world. However, mm -hmm. the politicians find the crisis. Or, or see the crisis as an opportunity for them to advance other agendas. And this is what we are really uh, uh, focusing here on. But in the case of the Gaza Strip, we've seen, and this is an article that you posted uh, again on your Substack account. I just want to um, screen it to the people. So um, you say the Zionist polio vaccine, virtual signaling, while they exterminate Palestinian 
children. Displaced infant Abdul Rahman Abdul Jadian, who it is claimed suffer from polio, sleeps at a makeshift tent camp in Deir el Balah, Central Gaza Strip, Tuesday, August 27, 2024. So we have uh, around 45% of Gaza population would be considered children under 18 out of a population of 2.2 million. That's 1.1 million children. Israel has been slaughtering children without a ceasefire for 11 months, killing children in the cruelest ways imaginable. Whether your vaccine perception, whatever your vaccine perception, why would Israel suddenly allow 1 million polio vaccines into Gaza and agree to vax ceasefire to save the children they have publicly declared declared they want to exterminate. By the way, just for the people, the uh, uh, substack of uh, Vanessa is in the description below. I believe that's the best way to support yeah. the independent work of uh, Vanessa Billy, who is posting regularly, almost daily basis sometimes, because <laughs> I receive notifications every time she <laughs> posts uh, articles. So you can follow her on substack, guys, and also can support her work there. Vanessa, why do you think Israel agreed for a VAX ceasefire and allowed one million uh, jabs of the polio vaccine, which I did a preliminary, uh, let's say, uh, research, and I found out that this vaccine that they sent to Gaza is funded mm-hmm. by uh, Bill Gates and Melinda, Fo- Melinda or what, the Bill Gates Foundation. Melinda, Melinda Gates Melinda, Foundation, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I think, first of all, you know, we have to put this into perspective. We're talking, or, or the WHO is highlighting the life of one child as important as the life of one child is with potential polio, because I have no idea how they've managed to test it uh, in Gaza, where there are virtually no operating hospitals. There, there's nothing, right? There, there's no equipment left. There is barely any electricity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And Israel has been decapitating and eviscerating children and maiming them and slaughtering them for 11 months. And in November 2023, it was an Israeli military official who actually said severe epidemics in Gaza would help Israel win the war. So in my opinion, and and in the opinion of actually many experts and analysts, this is bio-warfare. Um, against Palestinian children in Gaza, who we have to remember, they are living in conditions where, for example, the uh, vaccine-derived poliovirus can thrive because the problems that you have in, in the poorest areas in the world, so in Africa, and if you remember in 2013, in Syria, with all the influx of mercenaries from Pakistan in particular that were coming to fight with Al-Qaeda and the various derivatives of Al-Qaeda, at the same time that the WHO was carrying out an oral uh, polio vaccine uh, campaign in Pakistan. And the Syrian government made it quite clear that polio in Syria, the wild virus as it's called, um, had been eradicated in 1999. But suddenly, after 2013, polio started to re-emerge mm. as a virus inside Syria. And if you also remember in 2013, there were 17 children killed after being given uh, this, this I, I can't remember if it was polio or measles. But mm. anyway, the, the vaccination campaigns were carried out in the areas not under the government control in Syria, but under the control of the terrorist groups. And from that point onwards, there were new cases of polio emerging inside Syria. So this danger of the oral polio uh, vaccine-derived polio virus, if you see what I mean, is very, very, uh, it's high risk. And when you introduce this vaccine into Gaza, where again, the wild virus has not been seen for a number of uh, years, and you introduce the oral vaccine into an immune suppressed environment where there is filthy, there's no sanitation, yes. there's no clean water, um, there's no medical care, there's no medicines, there's no food, there's nothing. And there are multiple uh, skin diseases like scabies and so on that are emerging now because of this lack of sanitation and the the hideous trauma that these 
uh, children and elderly are, are living in. And then you want to introduce this oral vaccine, which, as I say, is responsible in those environments for shedding the virus and actually enabling the virus to spread. Whether you believe in vaccines or not, this is this is the reality, right? So your this is, in my opinion, nothing short of bio warfare in collaboration with the WHO, clearly, because they know this fact. They know, so does Bill Gates. They know that in Africa, in, in Yemen, the same situation, the polio vaccine basically introduced polio back into the country because, again, the people that were receiving the oral vaccine were living in conditions. And it can be passed through human waste. Yeah. You know, Gazans are literally living in human waste. Yes. Sorry to say it like this, but it, that's always been a problem in Gaza. Even when I was there in 2012, when it was raining, literally the, the sewage was coming to the surface. Um, and so in, in my opinion, you know, there has to be a degree of skepticism over Israel's sudden humanitarian reflex when it has effectively declared an intent to kill Palestinian children, to exterminate Palestinians. And if we look at it in a very dark light, which I tend to as regards the, the Zionist entity, uh, this is potentially the eradication of a large percentage of the next generation of Palestinians inside Gaza. And, and not forgetting there's no escape from this. So not only is, are, are, are the conditions appalling and squalid, thanks to the Zionist entity, but they're enclosed. Now the majority of the population is squeezed onto the beaches, not even in, in houses. They're in tents living in incredibly hot temperatures this time of year. All the conditions that foment disease and spread disease are now available. So why now, on the basis that one single child potentially yes. has polio. Why now do they want to introduce one million vaccines? And many people have used the argument to me, well, yeah, but the Zionists are protecting themselves. No, the IOF were given the injection vaccine like at least one month, two months ago, by the way. Yeah. So if you believe in, in you know, vaccine pharmacology, they are immunized, basically in the minds of the Israelis. So no, this has nothing to do with the, the Zionists protecting their own, nothing. They've already done that yes. before they introduced the vaccine that they know to be the most dangerous to uh, the Palestinians in Gaza. It, for me, it's, it's absolutely horrific. And it takes me back to history, to when the Nazis introduced the typhus endemic, for example, into the concentration camps. What is that, uh, Vanessa? Can you please Typhus elaborate on that? Is, um, it's a virus? Yes, basically. I think it's waterborne virus, but it's a killer. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically, the, 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 according to many reports in medical journals, they introduced the endemic as a weapon of mass destruction, again to kill off as many uh, Jews as possible, not only Jews, of course, Romanis and, and or communists and anyone that you know didn't comply uh, with the ethno supremacy of uh, the Nazis. And um, really, in my view, this is what we're seeing again. You know, there's absolutely not one iota of humanitarianism from Zionists towards Palestinians. There's more than 500 statements uh, declaring the need for genocide from yes. uh, political, military, security leadership and from, you know, the settlers themselves. They've been very clear about the fact that they want to see uh, Palestinians exterminated, as does 80% of the population, according to Alistair Crook, who you mentioned yes. uh, earlier. 
If I understood one of these comments correct, somebody says uh, Zionist, 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 get a life racist. And I think that this person is confusing between a race and an ideology because Zionist yeah. can be a Jew, can be a Christian, can be a Muslim. When we have uh, Zionist uh, uh, Muslim Arabs in the Arab world, if you don't yeah. believe me, you have to really be a little bit more active to see that Zionism is not about one race and one religion. And it's like a cross, let's say, a trend trans et uh, ethnicity yeah. or uh, um, or religious uh, ideology, it's an ideology I, yeah. yeah yeah i promised the audience of syrian analysts that i will keep the uh, conversation always like around 40 minutes because uh, yeah. people uh, people's attention span is becoming <laughs> a little bit shorter nowadays and when i see the statistics people start watching the first 20 minutes and they like uh, yeah. oh you know you know <laughs> it's like the same thing with myself so i will try to keep this like uh, 40 45 minutes as uh, usual and i would like to thank uh, vanessa billy first of all for dedicating the time for coming to this show for the critical arguments that she presents uh, we are here brainstorming guys we you can listen to what vanessa says you can believe her you can do your own research you can completely uh, counter her arguments all but conditioned with respect this is what i'm just kindly asking for you and if you want to follow vanessa's work she has her x account in the description below and her Substack is in the description below vanessa thank you so much for coming to the show Kevork, thanks for inviting me on it's always a pleasure it's my pleasure always and i would like to thank the hundreds of people who are watching this live streaming i would like to kindly ask you guys before leaving this live stream just to hit the like button thumbs up before leaving because this content can be reached to so many other people when you do that and just a reminder for you tomorrow it's wednesday it's going to be the last live streaming uh, before i go to one week of vacation so i just want to repeat that for you to know that tomorrow is uh, going to be a live streaming at 5 p.m central european time 11 a.m eastern american time but on Thursday, it's not going to be any live streaming. So peace be upon you and upon your families. And we'll see you tomorrow. Salam.